If you're writing to figure out what you think, then you're going to use what you think to guide your action, and the consequence of that is going to be how your life turns out. So I'm dead serious about what I write because, because I know what the pathway is. You don't communicate in a false manner because if you do, you will warp the structure that guides your actions, and you will absolutely suffer for that. I mean, one of the things I've learned as a clinical psychologist is that I've never seen anyone get away with anything. Let's say you get away with something. It's like, yeah, you think so, man. You wait five years from now, seven years from now. It'll come back. Is that karma? It's more like, yes, I think it's the okay. same idea. You don't have the power to manipulate reality. Like, you have the power to bring about reality sure. in some sense, because you confront potential, and through your action and your communicative intent, you turn potential into reality. So you don't think visionaries and influencers have the ability to bend reality? No, I don't think they bend it. I mean, you can bring new things into being, but you can't get away with a falsehood. And you can't get away with weak thinking either, because any more than you can get away with improper action. It just doesn't work. I mean, one of the themes in my writing is the danger of falsehood and at, any, at every level. It's like, well, if you tell the truth to the degree that you can, or at least don't lie, then you have reality on your side. You got to decide. You want reality on your side or do you want reality against you? Now, I wouldn't recommend the whole reality against you thing because you're not going to win. You're going to get flattened. Need motivation? Watch your top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle but you know you're capable of more and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today let's learn from one of the best, Jordan Peterson and my take on his top 50 rules of success. Enjoy. We are thrown challenges and that they're, that, and that in some sense those are best construed as tests of our ethical ability. So what Jung thought, his idea was something like this, that at the beginning of time, people were unconscious, and that consciousness emerged with all of its catastrophes, consciousness of death, for example. And one way out of the burden of consciousness was to return to unconsciousness. You can do that with alcohol. You can do that by being dependent. You can do that by failing to grow up. You refuse the burden of consciousness by becoming unconscious again. But there's another way for it, which is to become even more conscious. So the idea would be, a little bit of consciousness is like an illness, but if you can expand that consciousness upwards enough, then it's something, it starts to become something that, it's, that is its own cure. And that partly what your goal is while you suffer through life is to heighten your consciousness to the point where everything gets integrated enough so that that's proper medication for the disease of self-consciousness. It's one thing to live properly, and that's not a trivial thing, but it's another thing to be able to articulate yourself and to be able to negotiate. And generally speaking, there's nothing about that that isn't advantageous. And even introverted and anxious people can learn to do that. You know, it's, those are learnable skills. It's not easy, but, but, but you can manage it. You, you, can also, you can also speak carefully, you know, and listen to what you're saying and only try to say things that you think are true. That's also unbelievably useful. You have to feel that out. Like, is this really what I believe or am I putting it forward well, because I want to look good or I want to dominate or, uh, or I want to express obliquely an emotion that I'm too cowardly to come out and confront directly or am I being manipulative? There's lots of reasons that people use language. But what you really should use it for is to state what you believe to be true and then to let the consequences of that unfold. And so that can also help you. Simple truths, bluntly stated, can be very powerful. You don't need a lot of verbal fluency under those circumstances if there's evidence of strength of character behind it. Look, it's good for you to go take your place in the world. Have some ambition. Have, some, have a vision. Have a goal. Have a strategy. Try to, try to be a good person. In, in, not, not because it's your duty precisely, because that's the proper way to live. We're in danger of undermining all of that. And it's not good for people. One of the things that I've really learned, for example, recently is that there's a, or learned to articulate better, is that there's a very tight relationship between aspiration and responsibility. So let's say, well, the first question might be, do you need to aspire to something? And the answer is, well, yes, because you have to do something. You can't, if you just sit there, you'll die. You can't just sit there. You have to go act out in the sure. world. Okay, so act towards what? Well, that's whatever your aspiration is. You have to have an aim. Okay, well, what should the aim be? 
well, it should be something worth doing, let's say. Why do something that you don't feel is worth doing? What do you think's worth doing? Well, if you watch other people and and you judge when they're doing something worthwhile, you usually judge them positively if you see that they're taking responsibility, at least for themselves. What, do you want to be completely useless so other people have to take care of you? That's pretty pathetic. And maybe you could get your act together so you're taking care of yourself and your family. And maybe you could even do better than that and take care of yourself and your family and your community. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. There's lots of ways of defying the crowd, let's say. I mean, you could live your life the way that you want to live it. That's a matter of action. You know, and they say actions speak louder than words. And one of the best things you could possibly be is a inspirational example. So that's not nothing. Um, that's, that's something. Live properly in your defiance of the crowd, right? Make your own course. Allow yourself to be guided by your own genuine principles. You don't necessarily have to advertise that, which is in some sense what you're doing when, you, when you're debating because you're taking the manner in which you act, like if you're an integrated person and you're articulating that. Um, but maybe you can't do that because you don't have the verbal skills. Well, then the question would be, maybe you should develop some more verbal skills. I, like, I don't know this for sure, Dave, you know, but, but generally it's useful. How do you do that? Um, doesn't hurt to read. Really doesn't hurt to write. You know, a little bit of writing every day clarifies your thinking. You need a value hierarchy. It's inevitable that you have a value hierarchy and that you look at the world through it and that it should be well structured and that there should be something of divine importance at the top. I would say what should occupy the top position is the realization, for example, that each person is of divine value and that the most appropriate way of interacting with potential is by embodying and speaking the truth. That's not a bad way of briefly conceptualizing what might be at the highest pinnacle of the value structure. I would say that's what the logos is. And so the soul is a the soul is what manifests itself in the choice between different pathways, in, in the choice between different ways of transforming the potential of the future into the actuality of the present. And it does that by making ethical decisions, by choosing between good and evil at each choice point. And to the degree that it chooses good, then it takes the raw potential of the future and it transforms it into the being of the present that is good. And to the degree that it does that in a manner that's evil and contaminated by malevolence and hatred and vengefulness, then it takes a pathway that corrupts the world and makes things worse. And it's the soul that's doing that and it's the soul that's responsible for that. And it's also that active part of the soul that's shaping the deeper soul in some sense, which would be something like the cumulative consequence of all those choices, something akin to what people more classically have referred to as character. Your life doesn't have meaning without aspiration or an aim. Okay, so you need a hierarchy of values. There's got to be something at the top. It's got to be something important. If you don't have that, your life doesn't have any meaning. So if you criticize the hierarchy, or even the ideas of, idea of hierarchy, you destroy the idea of aspiration. And then people have nothing. Well, that's not helpful. People are built for a struggle and they're built for a weight. And you want to take on a heavy burden voluntarily. See if you can put yourself together. See what you can do out in the world while you're waiting to die. It's an all-in game. It better be worthwhile. And so there's a tight relationship between responsibility and aspiration and hierarchy. And when you criticize those things, you get rid of the aspiration. 
have to negotiate until you come to the best solution that can be negotiated, which isn't necessarily a perfect solution, but it might be the best one that can be done. And then you have to stick with it until the next negotiation. And if you get upset during the negotiations, which you likely will, because these are difficult topics, how to divide up responsibilities in the house and people get mad because they feel they've been taken advantage of or aren't being listened to. One of the rules was, well, you can leave the discussion, but only until you calm down and then you have to come back because these things have to be pushed through. They have to be negotiated through because the alternative is, well, important things don't get done or people do them resentfully because they're sort of forced by their own orderliness or their own conscientiousness or or but we know by force psychological or otherwise on the part of other people these things have to be negotiated through you can tell if you've got the balance between making peace and speaking the truth right if the conversation continues and it can be emotional and will be and can be difficult because important things have to be dealt with but as long as the people are still in the conversation and communicating then you then you've got the balance right you know, and you might have to take a break. Maybe you have to hold off till the next day. Um, maybe sometimes when you're negotiating something that's difficult, you have to offer the other person the opportunity to sleep on their decision too, which I think is often a very good idea. If you have to make an important decision in your life, it's very useful to tell the person that you're negotiating with that, look, I'm interested in this and it seems good, but I'm not going to agree until I sleep on it. It gives you well, lots of things happen when you sleep. You organize your brain when you sleep, at least to the degree that you can organize it. And you can often be more solid or more doubtful about a decision if you sleep on it. You need a meaning to sustain you through the vicissitudes of life. Okay, well, try to debate that. It's like, is life painful? Yes. Is it anxiety provoking? Yes. Is it uncertain? Yes. Is it painful beyond bearing sometimes? Yes, it's difficult. Everyone agrees about that. Now, they might disagree about how difficult, but that doesn't matter. That The central point holds. Okay, what if you think that's all pointless? Well, that doesn't seem very helpful. Okay, so you need a sustaining meaning. Well, where do you find that? Well, you generally find it in responsibility to yourself and to other people. Something that I learned, for example, from Jean Piaget, he called that an equilibrated state. And an equilibrated state is like a game that everyone wants to play. And so if you set your household up properly, then it's a game that everybody is participating in voluntarily. And that's going to be predicated on the desire for peace and the willingness to speak truth and the ability to take responsibility. So that has to be part of your higher order moral aim. And then when you're having a difficult discussion with someone, the discussion is going to be affected by that higher order moral aim. It's not going to be contaminated to the same degree by your desire to inflict pain and attain victory and, you know, crush your opponent and punish them for their previous sins and, um, indicate your disappointment things they've done over the years and all of that it's hard to say what the soul means metaphysically because you know say beyond the cons beyond the confines of a single human being we do have this sense that the soul can expand itself into something that's greater than well greater than it has been it has this capacity for growth and we do have the sense that the soul can expand itself to the point where it it's enlightened for lack of a better word that it's working as efficiently as possible to transform everything that's unnecessarily painful and malevolent about the world into what's positive and good and 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 that it does that as a consequence of confronting the world with courage and truth and i i think that's right and i do think that that means that the soul participates in something eternal which is the attempt of being itself to transform what's unnecessarily painful and malevolent into what's good. And that human beings actually do participate in that. And that that's part of the reason that our ancient tradition insists that we're made in the image of God. And I think that it's a mistake to 
underestimate the importance of that because I don't think that you can live life, a life of sufficient profundity to protect yourself from being corrupted by suffering and malevolence without adopting a responsibility that's commensurate with that set of ideas. I think that you either orient yourself upward, you know, to the star above the horizon and try desperately to improve the structure of being or you work at counter purposes to it and make things worse. I don't think there's a middle ground. I, in fact, to the degree there is a middle ground, it tilts towards the negative because people who try to occupy the middle ground um, try to generally try to accrue the benefit, let's say, without adopting any of the risk. And that's not acceptable, not helpful. So that's a soul to me. If you're having a discussion with someone and they're talking about things that don't have those characteristics, right, that they haven't made personal, then the conversation is almost never interesting. It's because the person is, it's just an, they're just, they really are an empty shell through which ideolog ideology, cliches and slogans are pouring. There's nothing about that that's compelling because you don't see the grappling. You don't see that the other person has grappled with the ideas and come to their own unique conclusions. And it really is in that mingling of the abstract and the particular that compelling wisdom is to be found. And so that's, that's, and then concretely speaking, well, there's ways of earning your knowledge. And part of that is reformulating it in your own words. That's thinking it through, right? And discussing it until you have it at hand. You can talk about it and you can generalize from it because you truly understand it. But a huge part of that is also putting it into practice and deriving your own conclusions as a consequence. And some of that can be done with debate. It's like, here's an idea I came across and here's the idea and here's what I think it means. And this is how I think it would change things if I put it into practice. This is how I understand this idea. And what do you think of that? Like that's a good debate or discussion, you know? Because then the other person can say, well, I don't really agree with the way you formulated that or I don't agree with your conclusions. And hopefully it's a real discussion and not just one-upmanship, you know, because that's a pretty dull game. When you're trying to lead people forward out of the darkness, let's say, um, out of anxiety and depression and despair and, and resentment and bitterness and anger and all of those things, catastrophic interactions with their family, is that you get them to stop avoiding confronting the terrible things that are in front of them, right? So basically what you do, instead of saying to them, you know all those terrible things that are happening? Just ignore those and, and, and find some peace, right? Get your mind away from it. That isn't what you say. You say, turn around and look at them even more than you've been looking at them. It's very paradoxical advice, but of all the things that have been proven to aid people's recovery and movement towards mental health, that's like at the top of the list. Voluntary confrontation with what you are afraid of or, or what you despise even for that matter. And so Jung had an axiom that he derived from the alchemist, which was insterquilinus invenatur, which meant, roughly meant, that which you most need will be found where you least want to look. Which is, Fuck, man. yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that was also his explanation for why people weren't enlightened. Because you think, well, the California approach to enlightenment to speak, you know, kind of satirically is follow your bliss. It's like, well, that's easy. If that was the case, everyone would be enlightened. But the Jungian approach is, no, no, no. You do what's meaningful and, and pay attention, follow the truth, and it will take you to the worst place you can imagine. And then maybe there's some chance for enlightenment. Soul is also the center of the world, which is a frightening proposition and, and not one that's easily comprehensible. Solzhenitsyn's work in the Gulag Archipelago is particularly enlightening in this regard um, because he insisted that it was a pre- preconception of our Judeo-Christian heritage that each person was a center of the cosmos. And you can think of that as a center of consciousness, right? A center 
from which being itself is not only reflected, but also generated. And it was Solzhenitsyn's belief and Dostoevsky's as well. And, and I think Jung would have been in accordance with this and Nietzsche as well, for that matter, that in some manner that we don't fathom because we don't understand the structure of the world very well, the outcome of the world is dependent on our choices and, and equally on all of our choices. And it, I don't understand, I know, that's, I know that to be true, I feel that to be true. It's, it's part of the doctrine that each person is of intrinsic and equal worth. The part of that doctrine is that each person is, has intrinsic and equal responsibility and that we're each capable of generating a fair bit of hell around us and for other people, but also capable of generating a tremendous amount of good and that the fate of the world as it careens through eternity is actually a consequence of the ethical decisions of each of us. It's a terrifying idea. It's no wonder that people flee from it into hedonism, let's say, and, and ideology, because it's very frightening possibility that the choices that you make day to day or fail to make have this profound and lasting effect on the structure of reality, but I don't really see any way out of that conclusion. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to who someone else is today. And the reason I wrote that was because I had this client, 10 years, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I spent 20 hours a week for 25 years listening to people, listening to people tell me about their lives, you know, and, and, and those people were people who were just barely hanging on to the bottom of the world up to people who were so successful you can hardly believe it, like the entire gamut of people. And, and that's been absolutely fascinating. It's like, it's like being a clinical psychologist, if you really listen, is like being immersed in a Dostoevsky novel all the time, you know, because it's amazing what people will tell you if you listen to them. They are, people are so interesting if you actually listen to them because they're so peculiar, like, they're like penguins or rhinoceroses or ostriches, they're unlikely creatures. And anyways, um, with regards to, um, to uh, comparing yourself to who you were yesterday and not to who someone else is today, um, this old client of mine, he was about 85 when he came to see me and he was a financier and a kind of a mathematical genius. He made these little pendants out of a, a, a mathematical symbol for the most beautiful mathematical equation that was ever written. He made them out of gold and he would hand those out. And, and he, he, had, he had studied psychology as a young man and he introduced me to this concept that I didn't know about called the Pareto distribution, which, see I'd been taught <clears throat> as a psychologist that most human characteristics were normally distributed, right? So most people were average and some people were extreme. That, that's a, pre or a normal distribution. Intelligence is like that and height, there's more people of average height than, than very tall or very short and, and weight is like that. And lots of things are normally distributed and psychologists tend to assume that everything is, but it isn't. Creative products are distributed in a Pareto distribution and that's a whole different thing and it's really important to know this. It's another fundamental fact, the knowledge of which can sort of transform the way you conceptualize, let's say, the political landscape. So here, here's an example of the Pareto distribution. Uh, you know, there's a rule of thumb that if you run a company that 20% of your employees do 80% of the work or that 20% of your customers are responsible for 80% of your sales or that 20% of them are responsible for 80% of the customer service calls. Same thing. But that's not exactly the rule. The rule is worse than that. The rule is in a given domain, the square root of the number of people operating in that domain do half the productive work. So you think, well, you have 10 employees, three of them do half the work. It's like, yeah, okay. What if you have 100 employees? Then 10 of them do half the work. What if you have 1,000 employees? Well, then it's 30. And if it's 10,000 employees, then it's 100. 
And this actually turns out to be a rather ironclad rule. It, it, it applies across very, very many situations. It, it applies, for example, to the mass of stars and the size of cities. So you can see how universal it is as a law. And it's, it's something like those that have more get more and those that have less get less. That's the Matthew principle, right? To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken away. And the economists sometimes call that the Matthew principle. And so what, what that lays out is a world that's rife with inequality. So you know, you, you hear this idea that I think it's the 85 richest people in the world have more money than the bottom two billion. That's a Pareto distribution phenomena. And you might say, uh, to hell with capitalism for producing that. It's like, sorry, you got your diagnosis wrong. It's a natural law. It's no, no matter what society you study, you get a Pareto distribution of wealth. You get a Pareto distribution of number of records recorded. You get a Pareto distribution of number of songs written or goals scored. Like any creative product has that characteristic. And it's partly because as you start to become successful, let's say, People offer you more and more opportunities. And as you start to fail, people move away from you and you plummet. And so, okay, so that's rough. So what it, is, what it means is that there is always a landscape of inequality. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do anything about it. Although I am saying that we don't know what to do about it. That's the thing, you know, because you can modify the Pareto distribution of wealth, let's say, but, if you, but we don't know how to do it without maybe disrupting the system so completely that it collapses, which is what happened in the Soviet Union, for example, and, and in Maoist China. They were trying, at least in principle, to adjust inequality, but the cure was far worse than the disease. And the, the truth of the matter is we actually don't know technically how much inequality there has to be to generate wealth. We can guess, and you could say, well, there should be less, and you might say, well, there should be more. If you're left-wing, you'd say less, and if, they're, if you're right-wing, you'd say, well, we'll just let the inequality flourish. But we do know that it's inevitable, and we also know that we don't know how to regulate it. So, there is inequality. What that means is there's always going to be people around that are better at something than you are. And, the, and that's, a, that's a problem, because you can get jealous, and you can get bitter, and you can get resentful, and worse, you can get hopeless, you know, because you look like, look like <laughs> I have this, this friend of mine, he told me something so funny. Um, he, was, he was decrying his, his lack of success in the world, and he compared himself to his roommate. And uh, he said, you know, his roommate, his college roommate was doing much better than he was, and his bloody roommate was Elon Musk. It's like, <laughs> Really? Like, it's like, oh, you're not doing as well as Elon Musk. Well, it's, I mean, you can see, it would take it rather personally, because they were roommates and everything. It wasn't like he was doing badly. Like, he was doing pretty damn well. It's like, I'm not as good as Elon Musk. It's like, yeah, well, you and like seven billion other people, you know? But, uh, but I thought it was instructive, because... Well, because you have to be careful who you compare yourself to. Now, you can't just not compare yourself to others, to successful people, right? Because then you don't have anything to aim at. One of the things I've thought about a fair bit is the meaning of the Sermon on the Mount. And as far as I can tell, it's, it's, a, it's basically a two-part, it's two-part wisdom. The first is that you should aim at the highest good that you can imagine. And that would be a good that includes everyone, right? So if I wanted what was good for you, say, if I genuinely wanted it, I'd want it in a way that was good for you now and good in the long run and good for you and your family and your community and maybe good for me too. You know, you could conceive of that as the desire. And I think that's a good definition of love, is that you actually want the best, you want the best possible outcome. And in the Gospels, of course, that's extended even to your enemies. Yes. Right? Is that, okay, if we're going to have things good, let's have it good enough for even the people that set themselves up against me. Because if the world was running properly, things would be good for them too. And that would be better. And it seems to me that that's a very good way of looking at things. It's a difficult way of looking at things. And then the second part of the Sermon on the Mount is something like, having established that as your aim which is no easy thing, by the way, right? Because you have to be pretty clear-headed and single-minded to actually want that to be your aim. Then you can concentrate on the day and you can try telling the truth. And you can ally. So there's truth and love that are allied together. Truth, love, and attention. It's something like that that are all allied together. Um, with regards to transgressing against the vulnerable. If you're plagued by bouts of depression and anxiety, that does destabilize your identity. So... Um, it's almost by definition. But having said that, look, this is when habit and plan 
and strategy are so useful. So in the periods of depression that I've had, what's and some of them were long and 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 certainly the most unpleasant experiences of my life. Um, you, this is when you need a philosophy, let's say, that's allied with your vision and your strategy to sustain you. Because what would what would happen to me is that I know I have these a vision, and I suppose the vision is of a world that's better in in that's less likely to descend into ideological catastrophe and where people are more responsible and more awake and more educated and 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 healthier all of that a vision of a better world you know a world that's less hellish at least but also a better world and some sense of what role i might play in that and and so that's very motivating like it's a profound goal to to try to make things better. And you can do that locally. You can do that for yourself. You can do that for your family. You can do that for the broader community. And all of that's worth it, man. It's worth making some sacrifices for. It's worth suffering for to some degree. And then you decompose that into the day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week strategies and actions that you're undertaking, the plans and, 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 and the activities that you're putting forward to make that dream a reality, to realize it. And then when the depression and anxiety come along, you think part of it with depression, it's like, it's just bloody endurance. It's like you get up and you work through the next hour. You try to stay on track. You try to implement your strategic plans to the best of your ability. And you hope and you pray that you'll get through it. You know, you'll get through it and that the darkness will recede and you, 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 you stay on track. You eat even though you're not hungry. You get up even though you want to stay in bed. You interact with people even though you'd rather be alone. And it's, 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 it's the benefit of disciplined habits can, can sustain you. It's like the boat you're rowing in through a terrible storm, leaks and all, and maybe you'll be overwhelmed, but you have the boat and you can row forward and that's what you've got. And so endurance is a huge part of it. And then I would say with its anxiety, it's the same thing. It's like, or very much the same as you're terrified and, and uncertain, but you move ahead to the best of your ability. And again, you operate at least to some degree on hope. And if you haven't got hope, then you've got blind, bloody endurance. And that's all motivated by some sense that you're working towards something that's worthwhile working toward, you know, and, and, and that is, well, that's your own long-term well-being to treat yourself properly. It's the stability and productivity and harmony and health of your family. That's a huge deal. And then it's whatever benefit you can be to the community. And if you have to limp along and drag yourself forward in order to maintain that pathway, then so be it. Because it's better than the alternative. Hire on the basis of competence using objective tests and let the cards fall where they're going to. And don't be afraid to tell people that that's what you're doing. Watch your HR department carefully and make sure that they're not pushing diversity, inclusivity and equity initiatives, that they're not requiring people to take implicit association tests that hypothetically reveal their unconscious bias, that they're not doing seminars on systemic racism and prejudice, and then they're not making the assumption that unequal outcomes, let's say, in terms of hiring in the STEM fields or in terms of employment in the STEM fields, which, by the way, are radically overestimated if you, unless you gerrymander what constitutes the definition of a STEM discipline, you just have to you have to not participate in any of that, and you have to make it known to your peers, which who would be other Silicon Valley founders, I would presume, that you're not doing any of that. You need an ideal because you have nothing to aim at, but an ideal is a judge, and you always fall short of the ideal. So how the hell can you have the benefits of having an ideal without having the crushing blow that goes along with having the judge that always regards you as insufficient? And so I was trying to work that out in the chapter, and this is something I've had to work out a lot as a clinical psychologist. It's like, well, let's say you need a goal, but we don't want to let your distance from the goal crush you. So you got to set up a goal and then you got to 
make the goal, break the goal down into parts so that you can move towards it and you have a fairly high likelihood of doing it. So that, that's a bit, bit of practical, I wouldn't say advice, it's, it's, because it's better than advice. It's, it's some practical knowledge about how to go about achieving an aim. Set a high aim, but differentiate it down so you know what the next step is, and then make the next step difficult enough so you have to push yourself past where you are, but, but also provide yourself with a reasonable probability of success. It's also what you do with children, right? You, you want to push them because they need to grow up and be more than they are, right? But you don't want to crush them with constant failure. So what you do is aim high and make the goal prox difficult but proximal. I think that the best approach to ameliorating inequality is to strengthen the individual. I mean, and that's, and that's what I've concentrated on doing. Like we have this program, uh, the self-authoring suite, and there's a component of that that helps people write an autobiography and another component that helps them write an analysis of their personality and another component that helps them write out a plan for the future. And we've used that, we've studied the effect of having people write out a detailed plan for their future. And, and it's a proper plan. It's like, okay, look, you, you get to have what you want three to five years down the road. You get to have the friends you want, you get to have the family you want, you get to have the career you want, the education, you get, you get to take care of yourself properly. You get to withstand the temptations of drug and alcohol abuse and other sorts of impulsive pleasures. You get to make productive and meaningful use of your time. Okay, what does that look like for you? Write it out. What does it look like? Just, you need a vision. And then you need another vision of how terrible things could be if you let all your bad habits get the upper hand. Mm. And we've had people do that in an experimental situation. And mostly they were college students. And the consequences of that, there were two consequences. One was general, which was that university students were about 30% more likely to stay in university and got grades that were, were about 25% better, which is a walloping effect. But even more interestingly, and this is the coolest thing I think that we ever discovered as in, our, in, in our psychological research, it, we did this research in Holland at the, um, uh, at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, at the Rotterdam School of Management, and we ran business students through the future authoring program for multiple years, so several thousands of them. And we stratified them by gender and ethnicity. Pretty, a pretty rough cut, men, women, and then Dutch nationals and non-Western ethnic minorities. Okay, and so the, the performance was like this. The Dutch women were at the top, then the Dutch men, then the, then the non-Western ethnic minority women, then the non-Western ethnic minority men. And they were behind the Dutch women by, a, by, a, by a, they, they showed about an 80% decrement in performance. Really quite catastrophic. Two years after they did the future authoring program, they were ahead of the Dutch women. It wow. just blew us away because it was, an, it was a perfect indication of the fact that you can use a psychological intervention to ameliorate what looks like a sociological problem. I've had clients, many clients in their 30s, who are trying to this is more true with women, I would say. A lot of women who are very high achieving and who established their career goals at 30 and then want to differentiate out, their, differentiate out their life. They want to have a husband, they want to have a family, they're trying to figure out how to do that. And one of the things I've noticed that around 30, you really have to stop comparing yourself in some ways to other people. And the reason for that is that the particularities of your life are so idiosyncratic that there isn't anyone really all that much like you, you know, because the details of your life happen to matter. And so maybe you compare yourself to some rock star or something like that, and, you know, the person's rich and famous and glamorous and all that, but, you know, they're alcoholic and they use too much cocaine and they've had three divorces, and it's like, how the hell do you make sense out of that? Is that someone that you should judge yourself harshly against or not? The answer is you don't know, because you don't know all the details of their lives. And who do you know that you can compare yourself to? That's easy. You. Yesterday. So here's a good goal, it's something like, well, aim high, and I, I really mean that, it's like, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. Aim high, but use as your control yourself. It's like, so your goal is to make today some tiny increment better than yesterday. And you can use better, you can define better yourself. This doesn't have to be some imposition of external morality. You know, you know where you're weak and insufficient, where you could improve. You think, okay, well, this is what I'm like yesterday. If I did this little thing, things would be just a, an increment better. And, well, th that's a great thing because you get the ball rolling and incremental improvement is unstoppable. 
You can actually implement it, and it starts to generate Pareto distribution-like consequences. It starts to compound. And I've seen that happen in people's lives over and over. People write me all the time and tell me that they're doing that, but I've seen that happen in people's lives continually. They make a goal, a goal that, the goal should be, how could I conceive of my life so that if I had that life, it would clearly be worth living so I wouldn't have to be bitter, resentful, deceitful, arrogant, and vengeful. You act out the things that you would do when you're normal, even when you're depressed. You know, you don't want to see people. Well, it doesn't matter. You go see them because it's better than not seeing them. You know, and you find when you do see them that it's better, it'll go better than you think. But you can't isolate yourself and you're anxious. And so you want to avoid, you don't want to go out. You'd rather stay home and sit in the chair and just sit there and like in a frozen position. It's like you can't do that. You have to go out and go grocery shopping and go out and have coffee and all of those things. It doesn't matter whether you enjoy them. It matters that you do them because that's what you do. That's what you do in order to maintain your health. Don't recommend any changes that you wouldn't suffer for if they failed. How's that? And that's the problem with large scale political action. It's like, well, here's how we should change things. It's like, well, they change them as well. It fails. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't hurt me. I'm not involved in it. It's like, you should be careful when you try to change things to make sure you suffer for your own stupidity. Uh, of course. Head down endurance. And that'll get you through bad times, that endurance. It's, it's, it's such an underrepresented virtue, that ability to trudge forward under a, trudge forward unhappily under a unfairly burdensome load is a testament to character if you can. And then it's something that should be encouraged and valued. So, you know, and I'm, I'm not making the claim that people who are depressed who can't get out of bed lack endurance. Some do and some don't because depression comes in very varied uh, degrees of intensity and, and you can be laid out completely by depression. So I'm not trying to make some arbitrary judgment about who's got endurance and who hasn't. You can't do that from the outside, but I can say that endurance is one of the tools you have to deal with chronic discomfort and pain. You know, and even if you have chronic pain, it's interesting because it's very much allied with depression, by the way. All of the research on chronic pain, back pain, for example, indicates, and chronic pain of all sorts, is that the more you allow your pain to render you inactive, the worse the outcome, including exacerbation of the pain. And depression is a pain disorder. And so that's very much worth thinking about too. It's like, move forward, move forward, move forward. You know, and if you need to talk to somebody about what your plan is for the day or the hour or the week, then do that as well. And perhaps you also have to help get the people around you to help a bit. I need a little bit of help getting up in the morning. I need to have breakfast made for me. So that all I do when I get up in my, in my terrible state of fog and confusion and terrible anxiety and depression is I have a shower because that's what happens first. And then the next thing is I eat. And then that's better. You're, at least you're out of bed and moving. And that's, that's a start, you know. So, and then you endure and hope. And that's how it is. And you do the same thing when someone in your family is sick or when you're facing a death. All of that. It's like one bloody foot in front of the other, up the hill. You can ask yourself that question. What would make this worthwhile? Nietzsche, I, I quote Nietzsche, I think, in that chapter. He said, he who has a why can bear almost any how. That's a lovely line, man. I mean, it's a lovely line. And, and it's really worth thinking about. So you think, well, how, how do I manage all this misery and suffering and futility? It's like, well, I need to figure out what I would have to do in order to make that clearly worthwhile. And so then you have your goal and then you think, well, I need to move towards that incrementally because I'm kind of useless and can only do so much and maybe not even that. And, but all I have to do is be a little bit better than my, my miserable self yesterday. And that'll propel you forward very rapidly. And, and you can succeed at it, which is also really lovely because why not set yourself up for success? You know, because otherwise you droop around like a number 10 lobster. And, you know, that's just not good. You get all pinchy when that happens. And it's not a good thing. We discovered that we could let go of something we value in the present and we would gain something we value even more in the future.
we acted that out dramatically in all sorts of strange ways over thousands and thousands of years before it was formalizable psychologically. But it's a massive discovery. I can forego gratification in a particular way and benefit in the future. So I can share the proceeds of my hunt and I store up future food in the form of reputation and the favors I've owed, I'm owed now by other people. It's a massive discovery. One of the things I've learned, if, you're, if you have a dispute with someone and it needs to be settled and maybe they need to change more than you, and that's not always the case because sometimes the settling requires change on your part. But let's say that they have to be defeated in some sense in comparison to you. You don't want to defeat them any more than necessary. You know, it's like you don't knock your opponent to the ground and then jump up and down on them three or four times in, in triumph. You know, you, 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 you pin them and, let, and then let them up. Minimal necessary force because any more than that just produces a counter reaction. And so, and I guess the other thing is too, is my motivation when I'm engaged, let's say in these discussions is that I'm not trying to win the argument. I'm not trying to win. I'm trying to say what I think as clearly as I can. And there is, there might be an element there might be one of the consequences of that might be what appears to be a victory, but the right victory is the victory for your ability to articulate what you believe. And that's what I'm trying to do. And so that's another reason to stay composed is like, well, okay, th this person has just thrown a curveball at me. It's like, all right, so, well, I could be thinking, well, I don't want to be undermined by that and I don't want to make a fool of myself and I don't want to be put on the spot. And of course, all of those things are true. But mostly what I'm thinking about is, okay, well, now I've got that question. I want to answer as truthfully as I possibly can. What do I think about what was just said? And I'm not calculating the outcome. I'm assuming this is a mark of faith, right? This is the faith that that people have talked about being something that has to be manifested necessarily. We've been talking about this since the dawn of time. What's the faith? The faith is that if you say what you believe to be true, then whatever happens is the best thing that could have happened. And I believe that. So that's what, I, and I really believe it. Partly because I believe that if you're deceitful, which is the opposite of that, or manipulative, or malicious, or malevolent, but maybe primarily manipulative, then what you're acting out is your belief that deceit will bring victory. And I just don't believe that at all. I, I, I just, I think it's a preposterous claim. And so if deceit won't bring victory, then truth is what brings victory, if there is such a thing as truth. And there's certainly such a thing as deceit, so there must be such a thing as truth. And so, and some of it's just curiosity too. It's like, well, I'm going to say what I think and see what happens. And that's an adventure. You know, that's the adventure of your life, really. And you don't want to miss that because that's what you've got in your life is for it to be an adventure. It's not an easy road, you know, it's a stormy sea. And what you have is the adventure of contending with, God in the waves, that's what you have. And the way you do that is with truth. And then that sort of takes you out of the immediacy of the conflict, whoever it is that, the conflict with whoever it is that you're talking to. You're trying to ally yourself with something that's deeper and more profound and more lasting, do what is meaningful, not what is expedient. And mm. to, to, to view the world as a, a place of resources that can be delivered to you, it's in some sense to be expedient, is to take the short-term 
it's to take the approach of short-term gratification, something like that. Yes. It's self-centered. It's materialistic but, too. Well, it is materialistic, but it's also, it's also, it's not optimal and there, it's, it's not wise. And the reason for that is, is that it actually turns out, like if we're going to have, a, if we had a continuing relationship, I would want to try to do a little bit more for you than you do for me. And I could do that even purely selfishly, say, because if I did a little bit more for you than you did for me, you would want to keep interacting with me. And I'll tell you, man, if you want to have a good relationship with someone, that's one thing you don't do. You open your bloody eyes, and if they do something that you would like them to do again, then you tell them how much you appreciated the fact that that happened, and you hope that it replicates, you know? You see, that, that's, if, if there's one thing you can take away from tonight's lecture, that's, that's an extraordinarily useful thing to know. Watch, and when people do something that they should do more of, say, look, I saw that you did this specific thing. I saw that it took some effort. Here's what it meant. Here's, here's how I observed it. It's like, keep that up. And man, if you love someone, you do that to them. That's, that's encouragement. That's such a great thing. The positive emotion that we find sustaining is experienced in relationship to an unachieved goal. It's hope that drives us forward. We want something, and if we see ourselves moving towards that, then we're, we're in the grip of the positive emotion that we find sustaining. It isn't the attainment. Attainment is satiating. Attainment shuts down the system that has been striving for that particular object of attainment. If you're hungry and you eat, you stop being hungry. Now, that's good because the hunger is gone, but that whole frame disappears. You can no longer strive within that frame, and you need a new frame to strive towards. And so technically, and this is well established as far as I'm concerned. We even know the drugs that people abuse, cocaine, let's say, amphetamines, the ones that are potent sources of positive emotion, activate the system that regulates our emotional response to evidence that we're moving towards a desired goal. So cocaine, for example, is an exhilarating drug. It makes you feel that things are worthwhile because it hijacks the system that does make indicate that things are worthwhile. So this is deeply, this, this striving aspect is deeply rooted in, in, our, in, our, in our biology mm. for, for obvious reasons. A lot of people don't read because they're afraid of books. The books aren't their friend. So you might want to get a few books and kind of make them your friend. Um, you can start with simpler books, you know, like fiction. There's lots of good fiction writ written for adolescents and children. It's pretty straightforward. You can start there. If you're interested in philosophy, there's lots of simple guides like The Idiot's Guide to um, Different Topics or a Beginner's Guide. I read those things all the time when I'm first investigating a new topic. You know, I start with the introductory material. Um, and I make time for reading, like, what, and it was, that was encouraged in my family. Like, I always read before I went to sleep. I read, and I, I still do that. Um, somewhat less so, because I've become so distracted by social media. But uh, you set aside a bit of time every day to read. And for me, it was always just before I went to bed. I go to bed, turn on the light and read for, Oh, when I was a kid for hours, but, and if you do something every day, you do a lot of it. And so I would say, well, if you want to read, if you want to make yourself educated, just put aside 20 minutes a day to read or 10, you know, some small amount of time that you could actually steal, not two hours because good luck, man. It's very unlikely you'll manage that, but 20 minutes a day, you know, that's two hours a week. That's 700 hours a year. You know, that's, even if you're a slow reader, that's a good number of books. And so you make it a habitual part of your life and you decide that it's going to be something that you value. You investigate carefully what resistances you might have to that idea because you might think, well, that's uh, pseudo intellectual or there's something more productive I could be doing or I'm intimidated by books or I hate books because I wasn't good at reading when I was a kid. and was humiliated because of it, or, you know, you've got something against intellectuals, or, God, there might be all sorts of resistances to picking up a book, and then you could listen to audiobooks, that's a good way around that, by hook or by crook, man, so you value it, you make it a regular part of your life, you practice doing it, and, and you, you need a, a higher goal, too, it's like, well, why should you read, 
Well, it's so that you're more informed and you can think better. Well, why should you be more informed and think better? Because you won't walk blindly into so many pits. You know, you'll be able to negotiate better in your life because you'll be more informed and more verbally fluent and you'll have a better sense of how the world works and be able to hold your own in conversations and that'll make you more confident. Those are all unbelievably good reasons. There's, to be highly literate is, is an incredibly massive, massive advantage, practical advantage, you know, and, and it, it shouldn't be underestimated. I already knew that I was a pretty decent monster by the time I had kids, and I thought, well, my kid, my kid's little, you know, like a baby or two-year-olds, like I'm a horrible monster, and so there's, there's an uneven power problem here. I better not let that child do anything that really makes me angry. You know, now you hear, now and then you hear about something horrible that happens. I, when I was in Boston years ago, I read about a woman who'd plunged her two-year-old daughter's arms into boiling water. You think, well, how in the world can that happen? It's like, well, you know, she's probably hung over. She probably just lost her job. She's probably desperate in six different ways. She probably didn't have any decent disciplinary, disciplinary strategies for children. She probably didn't have anyone helping her. She was bitter and resentful and angry. And the child misbehaved at exactly the wrong moment. And like, you're gonna be around your children a lot. And so you might wanna have it so that they don't misbehave at exactly the wrong moment. Because all, all hell can break loose if they can. And I didn't want that to happen. And so, And I knew that it was easy for people to hate their children, even though they mouth the words that they love them all the time. I saw very little evidence of that in many situations. And so one of the things, you know, you have a natural affinity for children and even more, maybe a more powerful natural affinity for your own children. So that's a good start. But you don't want to set them up as an enemy against you. You don't want to allow them to engage in the kind of hierarchical challenge that makes you irritable and resentful. That's not a good idea. And if the things they do make you dislike them, the probability that they will make other people dislike them is extraordinarily high. And so you can consult your own irritability. And you can say, look, kid, I used to tell my kids this, you know, when they were three or four, I'd say, look, I'm not in a very good mood and I'm likely to be unreasonable, so it'd be best if you'd go in your room and play for a while. It's like, I like you, man, you're a great kid, but like, get the hell out of here for a while, <laughs> you know? And they were fine with that. We'd trained them already at that point to be able to go play by themselves in their room, you know, which is something a kid should be able to do anyways. But, but you need to know what sort of monster you are if you're gonna be a good parent. And if you think, oh, I'm not a monster, it's like, oh, yes, you are. You're just an unbelievably unconscious monster, and that's actually the worst kind. So, and then the other thing about that chapter is there's an idea in it, and, and it's an idea that I think is well supported by the relevant literature, which is that your fundamental job as a parent, especially of a child from zero to four, is to make that child eminently desirable socially. So what, you're, you're a successful parent if, when your child is four, all sorts of other children want to play with him or her. That's really the, that's like if you want one marker of whether or not you've been successful. That's it. Now, some children are a lot harder to get along with than others, and some children have a harder time playing. And so I'm not saying that every parent who has a child that isn't popular at four is, is at fault for that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the reverse, which is you can be sure that you've been successful if your child is not popular exactly, but desirable as a playmate. And so then you think, well, what have you done for your child? Well, you've opened up the entire world of children to them. So because they know how to play, which is a very deep knowledge, and, and it starts to become inculcated probably at the breast, and certainly in the course of rough and tumble play at about two years of age, it's a deep embodied knowledge. They know how to play, like a good well-trained dog knows how to play, you know? You, you meet a new dog and you go like this, and the dog goes like this, you think, oh, that dog, it, it, I can go like this and it won't bite me, right? It knows how to play. And a, a kid who's awake and alert is just like that, like a well-socialized kid, if you know anything about kids, is you can take a four-year-old and make a little play gesture at them and they'll smile right away and start playing just right now. And that's what you want for your kids. And then everywhere they go, other kids like them and will include them in their play. And play is the way the children develop. And so if other children include them in their play, then the children develop. And the poor kids that don't get befriended at the age of four, we, the literature on this is crystal clear. If your child is an outcast at the age of four, the probability that anything can be done about that is almost zero, no matter what you do. And I hate to be so blunt about that, but I've, I know the literature and that's what the literature suggests. 
there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus, and it's very, very, very old. We share it with virtually every animal that has a nervous system. It's, it's, it's sits above the spinal cord. It's extremely old, evolutionarily speaking, and half of it governs fundamental motivation. So it governs hunger, for example. So if you're hungry, you posit the existence of something that will satiate your appetite, a peanut butter sandwich, and then you're happy when you're moving towards the kitchen. And then maybe you get thirsty and the hypothalamus does that. And then maybe you need to use the washroom and maybe you're too hot. And that the hypothalamus pops up these little motivational frames and then emotions modulate your movement towards the goal that's established by these fundamental motivations. But that's only half the hypothalamus. The other half is the origin of the dopaminergic system that mediates exploratory striving and positive emotion. And so the way our brains are set up way below what, way below the neocortex, way, way older than that, the default position is, if you're satiated in all the important dimensions, then you're curious and explore. Well, why? Well, because you might find new resources that could be used to to, to uh, uh, satiate those fundamental motivations in the future. So that heroic drive into the unknown is unbelievably archaic. And then it's regulated by fear and pain. You know, so you go into the unknown, well, you don't want to die. So if you get damaged, you experience pain and you want to avoid pain. So you experience anxiety. These are very fundamental systems and they are reflected in our narratives. That's essentially, as far as I can tell, why the dragon hoards treasure everywhere. The dragon is an amalgam of predatory stimuli in, and fire, which is a destructive force, but also very useful. So dragon is something like predatory destructive entity. And you might say, well, is that real? It's like, well, yeah, but it's a meta category. It's like there are lions and raptors and um, lizards, let's say, uh, 60 million years ago when we were st still in trees, the idea that there's a meta predator is a great idea. A meta predator is what all predators share in common. That's a dragon. Well, what should you do with a dragon? Well, avoid it. That's one answer. Another answer is burn it out of its lair so that it doesn't have baby dragons. The and the uh, uh, an even more sophisticated answer is well, confront it. You can feed your family with the body of a dragon. It's treasure. There's a higher order moral principle that needs to be brought into the situation. And you sort of described that right at the beginning of the question because you said, well, what, partly what you do when you move from an addicted state, fr from a psychological perspective, is move from a viewpoint of the gratification of immediate desire and, and maybe the accumulation of things as a marker of mm -hmm. success to the notion that, no, you actually have a higher purpose, and that higher purpose might involve being of service. That could be of service to yourself, which means you wouldn't be addicted anymore, because that's not a good way of being of service to yourself, but of service to yourself and the broader community, however you might define that. That's a higher order purpose, and it can integrate your motivations at, at a level that doesn't leave you at the whim of impulse. That's yes. the purpose of a higher order motivation. You do what you can to make the things around you better you better, your family better, and then whatever you can manage in your community. You know, um, if you're interested in the drug addicted and the mentally ill, you know, there are volunteer, you could volunteer. You could talk to those people and listen, because then you'd find out what the hell their problems are. And then you'd have some sense about how they might be helped, you know, but that's a hard thing. There's no helping from above drug addiction and it's combination with mental illness, unbelievably complicated problems. There's no simple solutions. So, and it isn't even necessarily obvious that the people that you see who are homeless and drug addicted and mentally ill don't want to be helped, is that sometimes they have problems that are so absolutely overwhelming that they can't be helped in any real sense. You know, like if they're unmedicated schizophrenic, for example, with a drug problem, it's God, it's just... It's just a nightmarish, it's a nightmare of insane complexity because schizophrenia is very, very difficult to deal with, even, even with medication, because the medication that helps people who are schizophrenic also tends to depress their positive emotion and decrease their motivation, you know? So 
the medications are generally helpful and the proper treatment guidelines, if you're schizophrenic, generally are stay with your medication because despite the negative consequences of the medication, which aren't trivial, the consequences of not taking it are worse. And that's a real Hobson's choice, right? It's a bit of hell in both directions. But if you really want to know, I would say, go have some contact with those people and listen to them and learn what the problems are. Maybe you could start seeing what might be helpful. It's a really complicated problem. And it's different than the problem of helping people who don't want to be helped because you have to figure out who it is that doesn't want to be helped first. And you don't want to assume that just because someone's homeless that they don't want to be helped. I mean, that doesn't mean that it's easy to figure out how to help them. It's not easy. It's helping people is a very difficult business and it's a very dangerous business too because you get tangled up in ways that you wouldn't expect and that can be an occupational hazard, let's put it that way. If you don't allow your children to engage in dislikable behavior, then adults will like them because adults actually like kids. You know, one of the things I loved about having little kids in Montreal, I lived in a poor area in Montreal. There's a lot of rough guys around there and we used to roll our daughter around in a stroller and these rough guys, you know, like, God only knows what they were up to. They were rough looking guys. You know, we'd roll our daughter by them and they'd, they'd like smile and they'd crouch down and make little goo faces. And you know, they were, you, I tell you, one of the great things about having little kids is they bring out the best in other people. You see a whole side of humanity, even among the darker parts of humanity, you see a whole side of them that you wouldn't normally see and it's lovely. And the thing is, if you're good to your kid in, in the real way, you can help them maintain that tremendous attractiveness that they have as young children and to respond to adults properly, like a puppy that wags its tail instead of growls and you know, goes for your ankle. And then wherever they go, adults welcome them and teach them things and pat them on the head and smile at them genuinely instead of saying, oh my God, here comes that couple with that goddamn brat again. You know, which is the horrible, that's a horrible thing to do to a child because then everywhere they go, all the good, all the goodwill is false. You know, there's nothing that you can do to someone that's more terrible than to put them in a world where all the goodwill directed towards them is false. That's a terrible thing. I took what I learned about what happened in the Second World War seriously. It's like, wow, we can be really bad. We should do something about that. Like that was unacceptable. Well, was it or not? Well, how unacceptable? Was it change your life unacceptable? Better be. If you want it not to happen again. And it's not like it, the next time it happens will make the previous time look like a picnic. We're way more powerful than we were. You know, and we're getting to the point of something Jung talked about, especially near the end of his life, we're getting so powerful that each individual is now a force of almost unimaginable destructive power if they so choose to be. And that's just going to, that power is going to continue to increase. And what that means is that the degree to which each of us has our act together is going to be something upon which the world increasingly depends for its maintenance. How do I stop ruminating? These thoughts are recurring and relate to every and any embarrassing moment I have ever had during my lifetime. I'm a 76 year old woman. Well, oh, well, here's something you could try. Write down everything that you're ruminating about. I know that seems counterproductive, but like, see, ruminations come up accidentally, involuntarily, unconsciously. Whereas if you write down everything that you're ruminating about, you're facing them voluntarily. So I would say, well, open up a journal or a Word document, whatever, and write down every time you ruminate about something, write it down and write down every rumination you can remember exhaustively, write them all down. That would be the first thing. And the second thing is standard behavioral therapy practice. The second thing, the next thing would be, um, write down why you think they happened so that you get a good causal account and then write down, well, what you might have done about them then, but more importantly, what you could do about them in the future to avoid that. Because it doesn't matter that something embarrassing happened to you once. What matters is 
whether or not you're likely to repeat it in the future. But my suspicions are that even if you just, you could just start simply, write down every ruminating, ruminating thought that you have voluntarily and, and think about them in detail and write them down in detail. Get every little word down. And then you have that document. And then when you have a thought and start to ruminate on it, um, then sit down later after the ruminating thought goes away and bring it to mind voluntarily. So every time you have a thought you don't want to have, later practice having that thought on purpose. And try that for about a month and see what happens. Because it's often the case that if you start thinking about the thoughts you're ruminating on consciously and confront them voluntarily, that they will start to go away. You see these mass shootings all the time and everyone does the same thing. Oh, how did that happen? Why did that happen? How can it be this way? It's like, well, why don't you read what they said about why they did it and just assume that that's the reason. And if you go, if you go, oh, well, the Columbine kids. Oh yeah, it was like, oh, they must have been bullied. Oh yes, because you know, the natural response of anyone who's been bullied is to go arm yourself to the teeth to plot the destruction of the entire city, I think it was of Detroit, to line your entire high school avenue with bombs and then to go and shoot your classmates. That's what happens when you're bullied. It's like, no, that, that's not what happens when you're bullied. That's a stupid explanation. It's shallow beyond belief. And it, and it really emerges only because people don't want to contend with the real issue. And the Columbine kids, well, they were contending with the real issue. You know, they basically basically said quite forthrightly that in their own arrogant estimation, being itself was corrupt and unnecessary, and it would be best if it was eradicated in the most brutal possible way as fast as possible. And you get to places like that if you dwell on revenge for three or four years in your mom's basement. You know, you can go to very dark places. Pick something, pick something, aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser, then maybe your aim will change, that's okay but at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's something that's open for everyone. You can do that. I shouldn't say that because I don't believe that. I think you can find yourself in a situation that's so dire that you don't, there's no escape from it. But that doesn't matter because this still, this is, the hero myth might not be the best we have might not always work, but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I mean, everyone dies and so we fail in some sense. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. Let's say you wanna fix up your house which is actually quite a lot like fixing yourself up, which is a very common dream metaphor. Yeah. For well, the first thing you want to do is go look around and see what needs to be fixed. You know, and, and this, the interesting thing about that, and this is akin to what comedians do, is that as soon as you're willing to admit, comedians look at a problem and then rise above it right away and make a joke about it, but as soon as you're willing to admit that you have a problem, then you're, you've immediately contacted the part of yourself that's at least strong enough to admit that you have a problem. And so as soon, the act of admitting the problem is actually the first step to solving it. Yes. You might say, well, and it, it's an optimistic step because you, you might say, oh my God, I can't admit to I, that I have a problem because what if I can't solve it? Well, exactly. So then maybe you won't admit to it. If you do admit to it, you're simultaneously admitting to the possibility that you could solve it. Yes. And then it can actually become something that's optimistic. You can yes. say, well, my life is horrible. It's like, okay, but I'm doing 50 things wrong. Well, great, I could fix those things and then maybe it wouldn't be so horrible. I've watched the audiences very carefully and listened to them to see what resonates and, and what doesn't. And I think the, 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 the basic argument that I've been laying out is that, well, we all have difficult lives, you know, that life is characterized in, in large part by suffering. That there's an inevitable element of suffering in life. I mean, obviously that's symbolized in Christianity by the crucifixion, uh, which is a very harsh symbol. And, um, and not only is life sorrowful, 
in, in, in part, but it's also touched by malevolence and malevolence of each of us and the malevolence of our social creations, our societies, and even in some sense the kind of blind malevolence of nature. And so it's, 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 it's a demanding occupation to, to exist as a human being. And you need something to sustain yourself through that. It's not optional mm. because the, the price of existence is so high that without that sustaining meaning, it, it, it corrupts you, it, it embitters you. And, and once you're embittered, things go downhill rapidly. You get vengeful and, and you get angry and, and you get destructive and, and there's really no limit to that. And I've been suggesting to people that the sustaining meaning that they can find in their life isn't to be found through happiness, let's say, because happiness doesn't work when you're not happy, when, 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 when things have gone badly for you, for, for, even for accidental reasons. But you can find sustaining meaning in responsibility. And you can take responsibility for yourself. You can do that. And if you take responsibility for yourself, you treat yourself as if you're someone that's worthy of care and, and discipline. And, and, and that has nothing to do with being soft on yourself or the pursuit of pleasure, any of those things. You can take responsibility for yourself and that works. And then if you do that properly, you can take responsibility for your family. And then if you do that properly, you can take responsibility for your community and you can continue to burden yourself voluntarily, let's say, with, with a greater and greater range of existential challenges. And all that that does is make more and more and more of you. And that works as an antidote to the catastrophe of life. What's the best method to retain what you read and to be able to use it in conversation? Oh, well, It's very difficult really to retain anything without recalling it. So look, if you encounter something and then you encounter it again, you can usually recognize that you've encountered it before. That's recognition memory. So it's, it's an important form of memory. It's, it's, it's the memory that's associated with familiarity, but it's not the same as being able to use something exactly. It's a rather shallow form of memory, even though it's necessary. In order to be able to use something, you have to recall it. And this is also a very useful hint for studying. Like if you're studying and you have to remember, what you want to do is study, and then you want to write down what you just learned. So you read a paragraph, you close the book, and you write down what you remember. Or you read a chapter and you close the book and you write down what you remembered. Or at least you sit there and you try to remember because the way you remember is by practicing remembering. Okay, so if you're reading and you want to use it in conversation, then you have to think about what you read. You have to put it in your own words. It's often helpful to close the book and write it down or to associate it with some problem that you're uh, currently trying to solve. You have to take the knowledge and make it your own. And then... And then that alters the structure through which you look at the world and that changes the way that you think so that when you have a conversation the next time that you're gonna have the conversation in a different way. So merely reading isn't enough. You have, to, you have to read and think and recall. And it's the act of recalling that produces the remembering and it's that act of remembering that puts that material at hand for you. That's why humility is always stressed in, in, in great religious traditions. Humility is precisely that. It's like you have to look at why you're not so good. Yeah. You have to, and, and, you know, that, that has to break down your pride to some degree and your arrogance. It's like, well, that's great because if you break down your pride and your arrogance, then you're primed to learn and you can solve your problems. So there's nothing in that. It's a bit crushing to begin with because you might think, oh my God, there's really a lot of things wrong with me. Yes. But at least then you're on the, on the road to fixing them. I just found out I'm having a girl. Congratulations. 
What can I do to raise her to think for herself and not fall into the modes of thinking proposed by popular culture? Well, you can let her think for herself when she's a kid. You know, what you do is so that she practices doing that. You know, um, and so that means to consciously encourage as much autonomy as possible. So how do you do that? Well, let's say she's a little kid, she's three, and she starts to get interested in clothing. So you lay clothing out on the bed and you say, well, you can wear this or you can wear this. You let her make autonomous decisions. You know, and with kids, you don't want to let them choose from an infinite menu. You want to give them a constrained menu. But what you want to do with your daughter is allow her to make as many decisions as she can possibly make as early as possible. You know, and that doesn't mean that children always know what's best for themselves or any nonsense like that. It just means that you're going to encourage her autonomy to every, in every measure that you can manage. And that means you're going to have to be brave and allow her to subject herself to a certain number of risks. So you, you, you raise her to think for herself by letting her think for herself. And, and that can start that can start quite early. Um, I would say when she's a teenager, she's going to fall into the modes of thinking proposed by popular culture because that's part of being enculturated and socialized. It's virtually inevitable and it's even somewhat desirable. But what you hope is that you've you've encouraged the capacity for autonomous thinking to a sufficient degree that it's likely to integrate with that more intense teenage socialization and then re-emerge so you get someone who comes out the other side as an autonomous individual and that works with boys and girls so so you know let's i guess you do what geppetto did in pinocchio is the first thing you decide is well you don't want to raise a puppet you know you want to raise an autonomous person and and then you think through well, what does it mean to be an autonomous person what sort of person do you want your child to be what what sort of person do you want to encourage your child to be? And then having, having, having established that vision in mind, that's going to guide your choices, but at least you're making the right choices. You don't want someone who's dependent and whiny and cringy and, and, and more frightened than they need to be and martyr, martyr-like and vengeful and malicious and manipulative and mendacious, all of those things. You want someone who can make their own judgments. And you can ask kids what they think pretty damn early. Like you have to be careful and not push them beyond their capacity. But if you know your child, you'll be able to see what level of decision-making they're capable of engaging in. And then you would encourage them to mature as rapidly as they can. You know, and that also means that you have to not allow yourself to fall too in love with the dependent and needy creature that your infant will be to fulfill your own emotional needs. You want to detach and, and encourage to mature as rapidly and as comprehensively as possible. And that will work. You know, and some of that's it. Some of that is negotiation with your child. You find out what they think. It's like, what do you think about this? What do you think about who should do the work in the house? How should we split it up? Like they can be engaged in the decision-making process as a very early age. And, and part of that, that encouragement is going to be reflected in your implicit attitude that the child is a real person who's capable of imposing their will in a realistic sense in the world, on the world and doing that in a competent and, <coughs> excuse me, competent and confident manner. I speak to my audiences seriously and pessimistically in some sense about part of the substructure of existence, the, the, the mortal side, the fragile side, but conclude, I would say, that there's more to you than there is to what faces you. Mm. And I believe that to be true. And, and then I'm encouraging people to, 
to attempt that. And, and then I think part of the reason that the book has been perhaps particularly popular among men is because I don't think we do a very good job at the moment of encouraging men. We have this idea that there's something intrinsically oppressive about the patriarchy and about masculinity in general, and I think that's nonsense. I think that strong, honest, truthful, courageous men pursuing noble goals is of great benefit to everyone, yes. male and female alike. Resentment is a key human motivation, and I would say it's, un it's a great teacher to, to listen to your resentment is one of the best things you can possibly do. You have to admit that it exists first, and then you have to admit to the fantasies that it's generating, and you have to admit to what you would regard as the way out of it, so that's all very difficult because it means learning things about yourself that you probably don't want to learn. But resentment only means one of two things. It means either like shut the hell up, grow up, quit whining and get on with it. That's one thing it means. Or someone is playing the tyrant to you, might even be you, and you have something to say and do that you should say and do to put it to a stop. And so maybe, and resentment can show you the pathway to doing that. Um, there's a meditation on resentment, and one of, the, one of the principles that I extracted from that is, like a resentful person wants other people to change. And if you're resentful, then your motivations aren't trustworthy. In fact, they're very, very dark, and that's why I went to the extreme with people like Panzram and the Columbine killers. Um, resentful people who want to change the world are not to be trusted. What should you do instead? How do you treat your own resentment? I would say, well, there's a, there's a great, I read this great line in a T.S. Eliot play called The Cocktail Party. And in it, this woman comes up to a psychiatrist, I think this is in this chapter, and she says, <clears throat> you know, I'm having a really rough time of it. I'm suffering badly. My life is not going well. And, and then she says, uh, I hope that there's something wrong with me. And the psychiatrist says, well, what, what the hell do you mean by that? And she says, well, here's how I look at it. There's either something wrong with the world and I'm just in it and that's how it is. And then, like, what am I gonna do about that? Because it's the whole world. Or maybe I could be fortunate and there's something wrong with me that's causing all this unnecessary suffering and if I, I could just set it right. I could learn and I could set it right. And so, well, I've been thinking about that for a very long time and I think, well, if your life isn't going the way it is, you know, you can find someone else to blame, which is pretty convenient for you and also relatively easy, or you could think, okay, I don't like life. I don't like the way my life is unfolding. Um, maybe I don't like life in general because it's tragic and, and tainted with evil. How do I know if my judgment is accurate? And the question is, well, have I really done everything I possibly could to set my life straight? Because maybe I shouldn't be judging it its quality or the quality of life itself or being itself for that matter, if I haven't done everything I possibly could to set my life straight. Well, so there's a, there's a task. Solzhenitsyn, who I'm a, great, I'm a great admirer of Solzhenitsyn, his book, The Gulag Archipelago, was one of the things that brought down the Soviet Union. And he said that one man who stopped lying could bring down a tyranny. And you know, he said that with some authority. And I, I think you could easily make the case that The Gulag Archipelago is the greatest book of the 20th century. I mean, there's other contenders, obviously, but he said when he was in the Gulag camps, you know, meditating on how the hell he got there, and he had a rough life, man. I mean, first of all, he was on the Russian front at the beginning of World War II, and then he was thrown in the Gulag camps, and that was just the beginning of his adventures, man. He had a rough life. And he was in the camps, and he was thinking, what the hell? Like, how did I, what, how did I get here? What's going on? I mean, he had Hitler and Stalin to blame, right? So if you, have, if you need someone to blame, man, Hitler and Stalin, that, that's great. But he, he, that isn't what he did. He said he meditated for a while once he realized that he might have something to do with, in some strange way, with the way things turned out for him. And he said he went over his life with a fine-tooth comb in his memory. He thought, okay, where did I go wrong? But by my own judgment, when, 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 I, when there was a path in front of me, when did I take the path that I knew I shouldn't take? Because you all know that, right? You know, sometimes you don't know if what you're doing is good or, or if it's bad. It's just ignorance, you just don't know. But sometimes you bloody well know and you do the thing you know you shouldn't do anyways. That happens a lot. 
And you know, why do you do that? Spite is part of it, stupidity. There's all sorts of reasons, but you certainly know you do it. Solzhenitsyn thought, okay, well, what would happen if I took responsibility for where I am in this concentration camp, and then I went over my whole life and tried to figure out all the things I did that were wrong by my own estimation that increased the probability that I would get here, and then what would happen if I tried to set them all right now in the present? And that's why he wrote the Gulag Archipelago, and one of the consequences of that, as I said, was it sped the dissolution of the Soviet Empire. So, hey, that's not bad, eh? Like, you make a real confession, you really repent, you, you do your penance, which is writing this book, and you completely change the geopolitical landscape of the world. It's like, and that, that's worth thinking about, because it's not only Solzhenitsyn who did that, Nelson Mandela did something quite similar. It's not so impossible, and so the idea that what you should do if you're feeling resentful about the nature of being, or suffering too much for your own life, let's say, is straighten the damn thing out. Like seriously, try it for a year even, try it for a week. Try not doing the things you know you shouldn't do. Try not saying the things you know to be false. And just watch what happens. You might as well give it a shot. One of the things that happens in the Mesopotamian creation myth, the Enuma Elish, is that uh, the gods are created they're, they're, the, they're the offspring of chaos. That's a good way of thinking about it. And they become very careless and they destroy their category system. They destroy their father, essentially. And chaos comes flooding back. And that's what happens to people who aren't looking at things and delimiting them properly. They become ap apocalyptic and do them in. So, But, but sometimes in uh, mythology, there is the positive um, confront confronting of the god, e.g. Prometheus. So sometimes we need to steal, oh steal the fire. Sometimes we mm. need to challenge these orthodoxies, don't we? Yes, absolutely. I mean, part, part of the, well, part of the death that you're describing is actually the confrontation with a form of tyrant. Like your previously addicted self was the tyrant over your emergent self. Yes, and so it's an internal tyrant, and you said it was predicated on a false value system. That's a false set of gods, essentially. And so you had to confront that. That is a kind of death. If you're seriously suicidal, and you can tell if you are, if you have a plan, like a plan that you've, that you've played out in fantasy multiple times, if you know how you would do it and when and where, and if you fantasize about the aftermath, like if that's a well-developed plan, then you should go talk to someone. You should talk to someone professional. You should let a friend know. You should let a family member know. Like you need to do that. You're at risk. You're in danger under those circumstances. It's better to have a plan. You know, what's the idea? If you don't have your own plan, then you're the tool of someone else's plan. So that's probably not good, especially if you don't know what their plan is. <laughs> so, so that's useful, you could do that. As the negative emotion ramps up in intensity, the amount of time that you construe as manageable shrinks. You know, and if you're extremely depressed and anxious, then you, know, you may be struggling to get through the day. And then you need uh, a map of, what is going to constitute a minimally acceptable day. And that might be one where you've done what you need so that when you wake up tomorrow, things aren't worse, right? You have to keep up with your obligations and your duties at least enough so that you're not degenerating downhill. A lecture is a form of theater. Now, it, it's a serious form of theater, but theater can be serious, you know? And, and there's a, see, because partly what I'm doing is I'm presenting ideas to an audience, but I'm also modeling the act of engaging with ideas. And that's the theatrical end of it. And I don't give the same talk twice. Like I have my stories and I have my collection of things I know and I talk about, but I try to, I try to do two things. Um, I try to, in, I'm always talking to specific individuals in the audience. And so I'm having a conversation with the audience. And so that's, that's part of the dynamic element of the performance. And the other thing I'm trying to do is to further my thinking on the topics that I'm addressing. And there is a theatrical element to that because it's, it's like, I think this, the closest thing really that it compares to is probably stand-up comedy. Although I think the routines that comedians have are probably more well and formally practiced than the ones that, that you know, than, than, the, than the talks that I, that I engage in. I don't really think of it as delivering a lecture to an audience. 
I'm trying to think about complicated things in real time with an audience there to participate and, and to use the audience as an indicator of whether what I'm saying is gripping and comprehensible. It took me a long time to understand why there's religious injunctions supporting humility, but to even understand what the word really meant in that sort of technical sense, and it means something like this. It means what you don't know is more important than what you know. And, and that's a lovely thing to, then, then what you don't know can start to be your friend, you see. People are very defensive about what they know, and for the reasons we've already discussed. But the thing is, you don't know enough. And the re you can tell you don't know enough because your life is not what it could be, and neither is the life of the people around you. You just don't know enough. And so what that means is that every time you encounter some evidence that you're ignorant, someone points it out, you should be happy about that because you think, oh, you just told me how I'm wrong. It's like, great, like maybe I had to sift through a lot of nonsense to get through the real message that you're telling me, but if you could actually tell me some way that I'm wrong and then maybe give me a hint about how to not be wrong like that, well then I wouldn't have to be wrong like that anymore. That, that would be a good thing and, and you, can, you, can, you can embark on that adventure by listening to people. And if you listen to people, they will tell you They'll tell you amazing things if you listen to them, and many of those things are little tools that you can put in your toolkit, like Batman, and then you can go out into the world and use those tools, and you don't have to fall blindly into a pit quite as often. And so the humility element is, well, do you want to be right, or do you want to be learning? And, and, and it's deeper than that. It's do you want to be the, the tyrannical king who's already got everything figured out? Or do you want to be the continually transforming hero, or fool for that matter, who's getting better all the time? And that's actually a choice, you know. Um, it's a deep choice, and it's better to be the self-transforming fool who's humble enough to make friends with what he or she doesn't know and to listen when people talk. And listening is a transformative exercise. Like if, if you listen to the people in your life, for example, if you actually listen to them, they'll tell you what's wrong with them and how to fix it and what they want. They can't even help it if you start listening because people are so shocked if you actually listen to them that they, they tell you all those sorts of things that they might not have even intended to, things they don't even know. And then you can, you can work with that. And so... And the other thing that's so interesting, you know, now and then you have a meaningful conversation, right? You, know, you have a good conversation with somebody, you walk away and you think, geez, you know what? We really connected and I know more than I did when I came away from that conversation. And during the conversation, you're really engrossed in it. And that, that, that feeling of being engrossed is a feeling of meaning. And the feeling of meaning is engendered because you're having a transformative conversation. So your brain produces that feeling of meaning for you. It says, oh yeah, this is exactly where you should be right here and now. It's, it's the right place and time for you. And that's a great place to occupy. And so a good conversation where people are listening has exactly that nature. And the reason it has that nature is because it is in fact transformative. It's one of the truisms of, of clinical psychology. Like if you're a clinical psychologist, a huge part of what you do is just listen to people. It's like, you know, they come in, they're unhappy and they'd rather not be, something like that. You say, well, why do you think you might be unhappy? And they don't know, they have some ideas, and they may have to ramble around for like a year before they figure out why they're unhappy. They get rid of a bunch of reasons why they thought they were unhappy that are untrue, and then you kind of get to the heart of the problem. And Then you might ask them, well, if you could have what you wanted so that your life would be okay, what would that look like? And then they have to ramble around a bunch about that because they don't really know, but the listening will straighten them out because people think by talking. And in order to think, you have to have someone to listen because you know, it's very hard to think. Hardly anyone can think. And even the people who can think can only think about a limited number of things. But almost everybody can talk. And you can listen to yourself talk. And if someone listens to you, then, well, then you also have a foil for your thoughts, right? Because you can watch the person when you're talking and see if you're boring or see if you're amusing or if you're engrossing all of those things. And so listening, that's a very good thing. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below 
on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. To see the top 10 I did on Simon Sinek, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. You cannot have innovation or progress without failure. It doesn't exist. Uh, and if you truly aren't failing as you're trying to innovate, then you're probably not pushing very hard because you haven't broken anything. You're making very, very safe choices. We could never have put a person on the moon without a bunch of rocket